Welcome to Seek Week. This is something that we at Alamo City have tried to do annually for the last several years, and uh, it has become something that means a lot to us at the beginning of any new calendar year, where we take seriously, try to take seriously, the, the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's his way of simplifying our lives, that, that we don't have to spend all the hours and minutes of the day fretting and stressing and worrying over the things of this life. He says, your father knows what you have need of. And you seek him first. You seek his kingdom first. And, and you'll see, you'll see how he will provide those things for you that you really need. For each of these four evenings that I hope we'll have a chance to be together. I want to encourage you to, to try to find a, a place that is quiet for you. It's amazing how the world just keeps right on moving along without us having to have input or knowledge of everything that's going on. To seek first the kingdom, as we've been trying to say on these Sundays headed toward this these few days, to seek first the kingdom means that really you, you can't have a you can't have a kingdom unless you have a king. And our king is Jesus. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And he has made it possible for us by the sending of his Holy Spirit to the church, to individual Christians. He has made it possible for us to feel, to sense, to know his actual living literal presence with us. Though we cannot see him, he wants us to feel his presence. Otherwise, he would have just made sure that the scripture was accurately recorded, that the message uh, written in words that we could we could read and, and uh, study, that would be all that it was. But, but why did he first send the Holy Spirit before he ever sent the New Testament to be written? Why, why was it more important that the spirit of his presence come even before the scriptures by Paul and John and the writer of Hebrews were recorded? It's because he wants us to sense his presence. And if nothing else comes out of these, these next three or four nights for you, if you can come away from it with the sense that there really is a Jesus and there really is someone who is the lover of your soul. And he's not just a concept. He's not just a list of rules. He's not just a list of instructions. But he is a real person. And he really, really loves you and cares about you. So where we're going to start on this is, is at that point, of, at that place of seeking his presence. Seeking his presence seeking the sense of the presence of Jesus right now, right here, right in the middle of the things that are going on in our lives. And, and I hope we'll understand that it's, it's one of those powerful and inescapable keys for strength in the Christian life, that the Lord didn't just leave us the Bible. In fact, before, please remember this, before the New Testament was ever written, the Holy Spirit was given to individual Christians. It would, be, it would be years later, it would be decades later that the Gospels were even recorded. It would be in the, the late centuries, late, late um, decades of the first century that uh, John would write, Mark would write, Matthew would write. But all during those years, the only witness that the church had of what Jesus had said who he was, what he intended to do in their lives, was the witness of his spirit within them. So that's where we're headed this morning, this, this evening, and, and uh, in the days uh, that we have together, the evenings that we have together. I, I want to I point you to, to a few um, passages of Scripture. One of them, just right off the bat, Jesus will say before he goes to the cross, he, he, he will say to his, his disciples, and speaking to us, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I won't leave you abandoned. I won't leave you 
without any sense of the Father's presence or the Savior's presence. I will come to you. He was speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit to make his presence felt and known. He would also say, it, it's, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter will not come. And on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of the Lord was poured out, out upon the church. And, and we, have, we have remarkably been blessed by the sense of the Lord's presence. Folks, listen, but if we stop long enough, if we disconnect from the craziness of, of this world enough, if we somehow are able to, to get our hands off of trying to control and handle the things that can affect us the most, if we will, if we'll back up enough to realize that, yes, he is here, and he does care, and he is able. And that's, that's in the Gospels, but I, I tell you, old David, King David, the man after God's own heart, David understood the importance of sensing the presence of the Lord in his life. He, was, he, he wasn't a preacher necessarily. He wasn't a Bible scholar necessarily. He was a head of state. He was a, he was a military leader. He was, he was uh, an organizer, an administrator. Boy, he, he knew that if he was going to get done the things that he needed to get done right and well, he was going to need to live his life sensing the presence of his king. He was a king, but he needed to sense the presence of, of his king. So he says um, in uh, Psalm number 16 and verse 8, Psalm 16, verse 8, if you can get your Bible and maybe follow that along with me. He says, I have set the Lord, I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. And then he says, thou wilt make known to me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. David was saying that which is critically, vitally important to me is knowing that the Lord is near, feeling the Lord's presence. All the things that would pull on him, all the things that would stretch him, all the things that would demand his time, None of those came to be nearly as important as his time away and his time sensing the presence of the Lord. Somehow finding a way to disconnect emotionally, maybe not completely mentally, but emotionally, spiritually, enough of a disconnect that those things weren't owning the way he thought. Those things weren't owning everything that he felt. But the one who would own his affections and own his thoughts would be the presence of the king, the presence of his God. Then he goes on to say, he, it, it's not just a once in a while theme with David. He, he kept coming back to this. Let me read a little bit of Psalm 27. Find, if you would, Psalm number 27. And I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version of the Scripture. He says, the Lord is my light and the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? And then verse four, one thing I have asked from the Lord and that I shall seek. And here's what he says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Shorthand version of that is he's saying, oh, the one thing I want more than anything else is to be in the presence of the Lord, to sense that I'm in the presence. Now, David knew that God is everywhere all at the same time. I would, and I know a place we can be where God is not, but that doesn't mean that we sense him everywhere, that we feel him everywhere we are. He's talking about the one thing, Lord, I want you to give me is the sense of your presence. That whether I'm sitting on that throne, whether I'm having to be a judge between uh, competing parties and folks who are in disagreement or trying to sort things out between soldiers or trying to keep things straight with my family, my kids. He said, more than all of that, the one thing I want, the one thing I want is the sense of your presence. If he hadn't made that a priority, 
if he hadn't made that something that he was seeking, it would have been something that very likely would have escaped him, like it can many of us, so many of the hours of our day. I, I, I can't dare to back away. I can't dare to drop and let go of this situation because if, if I'm not holding on to it, how's it going to work itself out? David just understood. There, there are some things, unless God, unless God fixes them, they're not ever going to get fixed. So I'm going to look to him. I'm going to seek him. I'm going to enjoy his presence. And that was, that was the thing that David kept talking about. Is it, it's a joy to be in the presence of the Lord. You know, if you, if you think the Lord's mad at you, if you think God is just ticked off every time your name comes up, then probably you're not going to want to be with him, not going to want to pursue him, pursue his presence. But who wants to be in the presence of somebody who's mad at you all the time? But here's, here's where that verse in, that Paul wrote to Titus in Titus chapter 3 comes in. It's so strong, and so wonderful. Titus 3, 5. But when the kindness of God our Savior... And his love for mankind appeared. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saved us. When the kindness of God, our Savior, when his love for mankind, he didn't come to Bethlehem. He wasn't born of Mary as Mary's child because God was mad at the human race. It says, for God so loved the world. That means he so loved you and he so loved me. Not after we'd cleaned ourselves up. Not after we'd started going to church. Not after we started reading our Bible. But way before that. Before we had anything to give him. But before we were, we were changed and worked on and set free in a lot of ways by his spirit. He loved us. That's why he came. That's why he knocked on the door of our hearts in the first place. Not because we had anything to give him. Not because we had cleaned ourselves up. But just because he loves us, and just because he loves you, when that drops 18 inches out of your head and into your heart, and it settles richly in your heart, you're drawn into his presence. You want to be near him. You want, you want to feel the sense of his presence and know that once you're there, he's not going to slap you, and he's not going to holler at you and fuss at you. There'll be some things that he, he, he knows that he, he'll need to talk with us about and straighten us out on, but it's because he loves us. The premise is he loves us. And David, David clearly under, understand that. You skip on down to, to in chapter, excuse, Psalm 27 and, and verse 8. Psalm 27, 8. When thou didst say, seek my face, when the Lord said to David, seek my face, seek my presence, my heart said back to you, thy face, O Lord, I shall seek. And he pursued that. He pursued that with great vigor uh, throughout the, the days of his life. Now, I want to give you one more psalm. I want you to look at this. And, and then we're going to turn you loose to, to just spend some time alone with the Lord. And, um, you know, nobody can seek the Lord for you. Nobody can seek his presence for you. That's something we have to do on our own. That's a choice that that we get to make. Now, this is Psalm number 46. So find, find that and follow along. And look, look at how, how the writer of Psalms, this is probably not David who wrote this Psalm. It's, a, it's another one of the, the ones who authored the Psalms, but I'm sure David would say amen to it. Psalm 46, verse one. God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. And it says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the people of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, verse six, the kingdoms tottered, the world is going crazy, but he raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come behold the works of the Lord who's wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow 
cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. And then look at verse 10. Look closely at verse 10. See striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now back at verse 10 again. Would you look at this, please? There are different ways to translate verse 10, the first part of it. Remember, the, the Bible wasn't written in English, so we have to take what was in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, what was in the Greek in the New Testament, and bring it into English, like taking something out of Spanish and bringing it into, into South Texas English that we can understand. Got to do that with verse 10. See, striving. That word literally means, here's what it means, relax. Let go, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted. Here, here's the bottom line. Here's the truth. Here's why, you can, here's why you can let go. Here's why you can relax. Here's why you can just be still and quiet in his presence. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. Bottom line, end of the day. Last line in the story, God is saying, I will be exalted. No matter what the enemy's doing, no matter what, no matter what the world is doing, no matter what's happening in the circumstances of life, here's, here's the truth. I will be exalted. I'm going to be exalted. What is right in my eyes will come to be. You can trust that. And as you trust that, you can relax, you can rest, you can let go. Now, all those verses before, many of them can talk about how the, how the mountains are quaking and slipping into the heart of the sea and that the, the earth is changing in its landscape and, and uh, there are wars raging. But here is what God says to his people. You be still, you relax. You let go because I will be exalted. Everything going on around you may be crazy, may be confusing, but I will be exalted in all of it and at the end of all of it and through all of it. You can trust me. Nobody can do it for you. You need to take all the time that is necessary for you to sense the Lord's presence and to enjoy his presence. Step back, settle down in his presence. Listen, listen for his voice. And then he'll give you instructions as to what to do next. But if he doesn't, you have permission to enjoy his presence for this next period of uninterrupted time. Just you and Jesus, just you and the lover of your soul.